Hi, I'm Barry Gilraith, Jr., minister of the Jackson Heights Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama. If you are married, if you know someone who's married, or if you hope to be married one day, then we have something in store for you today. So stay with us, and we'll be back in just a moment. In Him, all families are blessed. Join our discussion on Fabric of Family. You know, success is something that we want to obtain in all walks of life. The same is true in our marriage as well. But what does it take to be successful as a husband and a wife? And are there some things that I should do or not do that are going to help me to obtain this important objective? In our program today, we're going to discuss how to make our marriage great from God's perspective. But before we get to our roundtable discussion, let's watch this next segment by Robert Hatfield as he offers a family tech tip of the week. Then we're going to be back and we're going to talk about how to make marriage the best that it can be. I'm Robert Hatfield with your weekly dose of tech. Now we've talked before about podcasts here on the Tech Tip of the Week. A podcast is a multimedia file, audio or video, that is made available on the internet. You can download it and play it on a mobile device like a phone or a tablet or onto your computer. Now studies show that podcasting is on the rise. There are over 250,000 podcasts in the Apple iTunes store to date. Among those are some great podcasts produced by members of the Lord's Church. Now, I've highlighted a few of them before, but today I'd like to highlight some more of them. Let me direct your attention to the Light Network, an entire network of Christian podcasts. Now, full disclosure here, I'm privileged to be a part of the team that produces the Light Network. But I think that you're going to find something there that you will enjoy. Head on over to thelightnetwork.tv to check out a wide variety of podcasts for both Christian men and women. Each show is designed to encourage, enlighten, and empower God's people toward better service to Him. Some are specifically designed for men, such as Biblical Manliness with Chris Clevenger, while some are specifically for women, like Wifey Wednesdays, featuring my wife, Emily Hatfield. And of course, there are several programs for general audiences as well. If you like books, then you'll love Brad McNutt's show called The Book Club, on which he reviews a religious book every single week. You can track cultural trends and hear news stories discussed from a Christian worldview on Tory Clark's show called Culture Shock. There are also programs about restoring New Testament Christianity, worship, salvation, and even good news type podcasts that highlight good things that Christians are doing all over the world. Now I'm privileged to host a daily podcast for new Christians called The New You. Every day, Monday through Saturday, I offer a brief devotional thought less than 10 minutes each day to get us all on the right track for a day that will glorify God. Well, I hope that you'll check out the Light Network and subscribe to as many of the podcasts as you enjoy. You can check out and listen to all the programs on the website at thelightnetwork.tv. And to God be the glory for all the good that is done from it. Well, that's all for today. I'm Robert Hatfield with your Family Tech Tip of the Week. It's time for our panel discussion, and I have with me today James Gray of the East Side Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, as well as uh, Paul Sane of the East Hill Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee. So we, uh, we have some preachers from the East with mm -hmm. us today, East Side and East, east Hill. And east. It's good to have both of you back with us. You've been with us in previous programming, and we're talking about in our discussion panel today uh, personal qualities that help us to have a great marriage. Mm -hmm. I, I want us to begin though by just simply stating what the Bible says about marriage, specifically related to the permanency of marriage. Mm -hmm. It's to last. It's to last a lifetime till death we do part. That's what the scriptures say. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid too many today enter into marriage with more of an attitude of we'll try it. If it doesn't work out, We'll separate, we'll get someone else. But that should never, ever be the perspective that we have. Yeah. And I would say, you know, one of the, the things that is uh, mentioned there in, in uh, 
genesis, at the genesis of time and the genesis of relationships. Um, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. That Hebrew word there uh, has reference to a glue, a mm -hmm. permanent glue or a permanent welding together. And that uh, signifies the permanency of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, uh, that has to be at the forefront when you talk about marriage. Uh, divorce is not an option. Don't go in mm. with uh, to the marriage thinking that if it doesn't work, right. you know, that's the wrong right. mindset. I think people make a mistake right off yeah. the bat when they have that right. mindset going into a marriage. Right, right. Now, I, the, I know the two of you have been married for <clears throat> uh, to your spouses for a long time. Paul, I believe you've been married for almost right at 50 years Next now. Next month, Lord willing. And uh, James, you've been married, I believe, 39 years. Right, yeah. Uh, my wife and I have been uh, married 30 years. It's coming uh, later on this year. Uh, so, um, you know, I, th I believe those who are, who are represented today on the panel are, are those who not only uh, teach what the Bible says about the permanency of marriage, but we're striving to live by it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's important that all of us do this. Mm -hmm. uh, preachers, but not preachers only, uh, members of the congregation, um, those out there in the community, because marriage is not simply a, a church institution. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's not at all, is it? Right. It's a separate institution that God right. gave. Right. Recently, well, I say recently, it's been a, a while ago now, at East Tilbury, we had a Sunday where we honored those who've been married several years. And East Hill was made up of a, a group of people at that time that was phenomenal. I had never known of any congregation that was similar to it. We had 28 that had been married over 40 years. We had 25 more couples that had been married over 50 years. We had eight couples that have been married over 60 years. We had one couple that had been married over 70 years. And we honored all of them at that time. But it's the stability of our society. Mm. It is the stability of that church. When you look at families that have made that type of commitment, I often have asked concerning what was the secret? What was the one ingredient that really helped make it? And invariably it would come back true love, genuine love, unselfishness, mm -hmm. the comments that would be made. And those are mm -hmm. key elements to the, that success of that marriage. Mm -hmm. don't, don't you think though that those individuals that you ask that question to, they have a different understanding of love as opposed to what is generally mm -hmm. perceived as love today? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. The love that they have is the love that I believe is the biblical definition of love where we act in the best interest of our spouse. We do that which is in the, their best interest. We put ourselves aside mm -hmm. and we're interested in helping them be the best person they can be, willing to give of ourselves for them. Mm -hmm. Someone says, oh, getting married, that's 50-50 and we meet in the halfway point, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Each going the 100% mm -hmm. and we give of ourselves to that successful marriage. Mm -hmm. And someone's rightly noted the problem with seeing marriage as 50-50 mm -hmm. is we have a hard time knowing when our 50 uh, ends and <laughs> mm -hmm. our spouses begins. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that's very true. Marriage is 100% commitment on uh, the part of both parties. Uh, James, why do you think, though, that uh, so many marriages do fail today? Because many do. Yes, I, I, I look at the statistics all of the time. And I was just reviewing some uh, not too long ago. Um, 50, 51 percent of all marriages are uh, in, in divorce and alarmingly, and this is what really startled me, and, and uh, in Alabama, uh, I think it's uh, 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 53, and that, that startled me, you know, higher than the national average. Mm. Um, but there, I think there are a lot of contributing factors of, uh, uh, of marriages failing. One of them is, uh, as we said a few minutes ago, um, sometimes individuals go into the marriage with that idea if it doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know, setting themselves up for uh, a divorce in, in, in the future. And I say all the time, don't go into a marriage with that, you know. Marriage is a permanent institution, you know. There are ways to make it work. 
And um, maybe that's one of the reasons, uh, maybe small reasons, uh, that we sometimes go into the marriage with that, you know, mm. that idea. Good yeah. point. Paul? Yeah. Satan's powerful influence, uh, mm. our adversary, the devil, roaring lion, 1 mm. Peter 5, 8, and look at all of the ways that he bombards the, the Christian home, uh, enticing us through television, through music, through videos, through movies. Uh, we watch on television immorality, uh, bed jumping from spouse mm. to spouse and so forth. And we're programmed, if we're not careful, brainwashed into thinking that that's norm and, and acceptable when God says we become one and there's not to be a violation of that, a, an abortion of that. And, uh, but our, our adversaries attempt to seduce us into thinking that we're dissatisfied with our mm -hmm. spouse. We need more financial compensation or we need more and more of things in order to be happy. Mm -hmm. Luke 12 still says that our life does not consist of the things that we have. Happiness mm -hmm. is not hinged on our externals but as we bond ourselves together, as we journey here on earth, spouse hand in hand, determined to reach heaven mm -hmm. and let the world be pushed out and mm -hmm. determined that we're gonna live righteous lives, keeping our eyes on mm -hmm. the goal, refusing, restraining ourselves from Satan's enticements. Mm -hmm. Have you gentlemen ever had the experience when you were doing some counseling uh, talking with uh, maybe a couple who was going through marital conflict or maybe an individual who came to you uh, directly uh, with their spouse not being there. And, and when you began to, to uh, talk with them about their relationship, uh, eventually it comes out, well, you see, the problem with my relationship is him mm -hmm. or the problem with my relationship is her. Mm -hmm. In other words, the shifting mm -hmm. of the focus and blame on the other party. Why do you think that we are so quick to want to point out the flaws, the shortcomings in our spouse's life as being the reason for us having the problems we're having? Just human nature, I think. You know, you, you, we don't want to own our own problems. You know, we want to, uh, because once we say that it's our problem, then why aren't you doing something about it, you know? As long as we can say it's someone else's problem, then it kind of justifies the conflict or whatever. So I, I think it's just human nature to, to point out, you know, the other person's uh, 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 faults. And this is what I normally say all of the time, you know. And when, when there are problems, when there are conflicts in the, in the relationship, I look at each part. What did you do to contribute to this situation? Be honest with us, be honest with me, be honest with yourself, be honest with God. And uh, then we get down to the real nitty gritty. Here. But no, James, I want to tell you what they did to contribute <laughs> to this situation. Yeah, and, and that always is, is the case. But I stopped uh -huh. them and, and normally I said, hey, let's stop. Mm -hmm. I want to know. And I had a, a wife to do that. And she just, she would not tell me. <laughs> and I said, no, let's back up. What did you do? Why do we do that? You know, pride. Do you think I, that's, yeah, that's I, part of it? Yes, yes. Well, it takes the spotlight off of ourselves. Mm -hmm. In other words, like James mentioned a moment ago, if I acknowledge the fact that I'm the cause, but if I can point the finger at the other, and I, I don't have to own up to my own. Mm -hmm. uh, well, look at look at Adam and Eve. Yeah. Adam saying the woman, well, the well, woman well, did well, it, and, and the one that you gave me, God. I yeah. mean, he even accused God, God yeah. and then the woman said, "Well, the devil." Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Flip Wilson of years past, yeah. the devil made he me do, do it. it. Yeah. And but but the passing of the buck, so to speak, to someone else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I think about uh, King Saul uh, when he was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites and. Uh, when he was being held accountable for his own actions, what did he do? He began mm -hmm. to try and blame, well, you know, the people, you mm -hmm. see. That's the reason. And, and uh, really our intentions were good and uh, trying to justify himself. In and, fact, if you remember, he even said, I have done it. Yeah. I did what you told yeah. me to do. Yeah. In other words, for himself, he was doing what was right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, uh, you know, we do have the tendency to want to focus on others mm -hmm. as opposed to our, our own uh, contribution. But is, is that really the way to, to fix a, a marriage that's uh, broken is uh, simply to focus on our spouse? Is that, is that how you do it or, or do we have to start with ourselves? I think really you just got to look at self first. 
not denying the fact that uh, the other sure. party is involved in contributing to the... Right, uh, absolutely. And, and, and once you do that, uh, once you own up to your part of the problem, it then releases the pressure, you know, or allows the person to look at themselves also and not having this arrogance, you know. Uh, I think it helps the other person to look at themselves. And so if I'm the problem, I've, I've contributed to the problem, I first own up to my, my part of the, the problem. And then with the hopes that this person can also see their, uh, their problem, because usually there are two people, there are problems on both ends, you know, uh, usually, you know. Well, and none so, of us are perfect, are right, we? Right, right. And either the problem occurred or initiated by one and actually uh, was carried over and, uh, or, or, or actually um, uh, carried out by another person. But both parties many times are, are, are guilty. Let me mm. just put it that way. We sometimes have heard the phrase, probably all of us have, it takes two to fight. Mm. Okay? It takes two to fight. And if one will restrain himself or herself, the fight usually will uh, be destroyed. But it also takes two to make a wonderful, godly marriage. Mm. It takes both being willing to do their part. It takes both of them working at it and growing into the marriage that God wants them to be. And, and mm. unless there's both parties that working at it yeah. to that degree, it'll never be as successful as, as it otherwise could be. Some great discussion today. We're about halfway through this segment of our program, but we have a segment that we're going to watch at this time, and uh, it's a segment that we call Making Wise Decisions About. It's a segment that's done by Harrison Chastain, and these segments are always directed uh, in a way that are beneficial not only to us who may be grown, but especially those who are young people. And so uh, Harrison today is going to be talking about how that it's important we make wise decisions in our dating relationships. Kind of fits right in with some of the things we've been talking about today. So let's watch this segment together, gentlemen, and then we'll be back to finish up our discussion. Jared and Sally had been dating for three years. They met early in high school and they knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that that was the one. That they had met the one for each other, that they had met the one they were going to marry, and also they had met the one that they were going to spend the rest of their lives with. But they discovered very quickly that there was one thing missing in their relationship. They both realized that they had never had sex. And so they decided, hey, we're going to do this. So they take their relationship all the way, if you will, and they have sex. Statistically speaking, the relationship lasted two or three weeks afterwards and they broke up. It turns out that Sally became pregnant. Nine months later, the child was born. And Sally, because they broke up, was left to care for the child on her own. And Jared had to pay 18 years in child support. It is no doubt about it that God has ordained the sexual relationship. He has, he has ordained it to be enjoyable. He has also ordained it to bring a couple closer together. But God, like everything else, has set boundaries for this relationship. God has set boundaries for sex to only be in marriage. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, it says that marriage is honorable among all. In other words, that marriage is good. God ordained a man and a woman to spend the rest of their lives together. But once you have made that commitment to that person, then the Bible says in that verse, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. Meaning that once you have made that relationship commitment to, the, to that person for the rest of your life, then sex is permissible. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis chapter 2, when God created the world, He created Adam. And he created Eve. He then took the rib from Adam and made Eve to be his companion, to be by his side. And the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 3, when Adam, when Eve, excuse me, when Eve sinned, that God came in the garden and he found them. Not only he found them, but the Bible says he found them naked. Sex was meant to be enjoyable. It was meant, it was designed by God to be enjoyable, to bring a couple closer together, but only if 
it is done the way that God has intended it to be. We know all throughout our lives we have different things that we need to trust God with. And God has given us a gift. He's given us this relationship that we have. And just like everything else that we have to trust God with and His planning and His timing, we must trust God and His timing for our sexual lives. Sex is meant to be enjoyable. It's meant to bring a couple closer together. But we can only benefit from that if we follow God's design, marriage, and then the sexual relationship. Well, Harrison Chastain always does a wonderful job with that segment. We appreciate him uh, offering that good advice for us in our uh, program today. I'm going to continue our discussion with James Gray and also Paul Sane. And we're talking about personal qualities that help to make marriage great. Gentlemen, I'd like to uh, just throw out this question and see how you might respond. As far as personal qualities or traits that uh, we need to cultivate and develop in our life, what are some of these traits that are really important to make marriage as great as it can possibly be? You know, let me ask the answer that one in this way, somewhat uh, frivolously and then very seriously. Uh, I mentioned earlier that my wife and I next month will have been married 50 years. And recently, I foolishly made a statement to a group of people that uh, we're about two or three months away from being married 50 years. After that, my wife said, we haven't made it yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and her point was very humorous. <laughs> Humor is so important. Well, laughing yes. together yes. and being happy together, joyful together, laughing at each other, laughing about yourself, mm -hmm. etc. And while that's somewhat frivolous, but it's an important quality too. Mm -hmm. But now the serious thought would have to be genuine biblical love. In Ephesians 5, Paul would say, and he said, I'm speaking about the church in verse 33, but he makes the comparison to the husband and the wife and the husband loving the wife even as Christ loved the church. The depth of the love that our Savior had to shed His own blood, purchasing the church with His own blood, and the willingness that he had to sacrifice to that extent, mm -hmm. he makes that parallel to the husband's love for the wife. Mm -hmm. When we love our wives to that extent, and the love is exchanged or mutually exchanged, we'll get through the problems. Mm -hmm. There will be mountains and valleys, mm -hmm. but we'll get through them because of that quality that we have for each other. Wow. Love avails all things. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. does for a pastor. Mm -hmm. What else, James? I want to jump from what Paul says a few minutes ago, or tie into what he says. Normally, we, when we talk about marriage, we don't normally think about, and especially those who are getting married, about self-sacrifice mm -hmm. and gave himself for it. That's what Paul says in reference to Christ giving himself for the church, you know. We don't like to talk about self-sacrifice, but marriage is self-sacrifice and that's I think that's what Paul was alluding to when he talked made that comparison of the church and, and, and Christ and, and the marriage you know there has to be some self-sacrifice that is a quality that will take a marriage a long way that mm -hmm. being able to sacrifice myself for this individual yeah. Uh, and that's a part of love too, that sac self-sacrificing love. And it's not, we're not just talking about here the sacrifice of your life. No. Though that certainly would include, mm -hmm. uh, be included for a husband, mm -hmm. but, but, but there are other things. Uh, there are other things we sacrifice mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. order to, to have this relationship, such as? Time. Time. Uh, I mean, that's a, uh, instead of going to the gym with the guys and playing ball, whatever, Spend some time at home with my wife. Yeah. Um, that's self-sacrificing. Yes. And there are other little things. Instead of buying something that pleases me, I, I forego it. that and put it on my wife. Yeah. And those kind of little sacrifices just build a relationship, uh, build it strong, you know. You know, building off of that, dovetailing somewhat, James, uh, you built off of mine, I'm going to build off okay. yours just a little <laughs> bit. Because they all connect. Mm. They all link together. Uh, I was thinking of Willard Harley's book, His Needs, Her Needs, and I use that book quite often in, in counseling and premarital counseling and so forth, or even marriage counseling, and to meet 
each other's needs, whether it's sacrificing, uh, giving of myself, sacrificing of time, or, or, or whatever it may be, expe expressing true love, meeting her needs. Man and woman are, are built different. They're totally different. God made us unique, and her needs are not exactly as my needs, as mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Harley points out. The idea being she desires first and foremost affection. His need may be primarily sexual or companionship in some way, but again, to live with them according to knowledge and to meet their needs, which alleviates then the problem of him or her, either one seeking companionship or seeking the fulfillment of their needs from an, another entity, a third party that must not be a part of that marriage. When you meet the needs of your spouse, they will not go looking elsewhere. Amen. You know, in order to be an expert or be successful in anything, you've got to spend time studying it, yes. knowing mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to start a business and you want to be successful in it, you've mm -hmm. got to know the business. Mm -hmm. The same ought to be said concerning our relationship with our spouse. We need to know our spouse. Mm -hmm. We need to know what's important to them. Uh, we need to know what makes them happy, what doesn't make them happy. So true. And, and you know, the, the energies we would invest into preparing for a business or preparing uh, perhaps to study some subject to uh, give a presentation, you know, we ought to give that same interest into knowing who our spouse really is. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, an excellent point, uh, Paul, that you've made and James as well. Um, we don't have but maybe just uh, uh, really just about uh, 20 seconds left, but uh, anything else that you would like to contribute on the, the, the subject? Walk in your spouse's shoes. Mm -hmm. Practice the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Love them as Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. These are not just cliches that are meaningless but are powerful. Mm -hmm. right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. and I believe this program will help some who are watching. Thank you so much. Well, that's all the time that we have for our program today. We want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to watch Fabric of Family each and every week on this channel. Fabric of Family is brought to you by Churches of Christ in your area. And in fact, there are some various congregations that are involved in a special way in our program. And they're going to be listed on the screen in the following. We want to invite you to visit with them or one of the uh, congregations in your area. And also, if you have interest in a Bible study, we have a free Bible correspondence course. We would be happy to send that out so that you can uh, partake of that study in the Word of God. Just let us know. You can email us. You can call us. You can write us. Whatever is most convenient for you. And we'll be glad to get that out. Until next time, I'm Barry Gilreath, Jr., minister of the Jackson Heights Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, wishing you and your family a wonderful week.